All right. I think uh, I've been nominated to kick this off uh, in, in lieu of Karen, who might join us here in a minute. Um, Karen, who's the Chief Public Safety Brand Officer at Rapid SOS. Uh, so I'm going to read some introductory remarks, and then we'll we'll have each panelist uh, quickly introduce themselves, and then we'll dive right in, because I know uh, we don't have a ton of time to talk about some really cool stuff. So uh, Ready23 is hosted by Rapid SOS. If you're not familiar, uh, Rapid SOS is an intelligent safety platform that securely links life-saving data to monitoring centers, 911, and first responders in emergencies. At Ready23, uh, we aim to foster a sense of unity and shared purpose among all stakeholders in the emergency response ecosystem. Ready23 is an opportunity to connect, collaborate, and catalyze change in the world of public safety and emergency response. Uh, we encourage you to actively engage on this virtual event platform and participate in this event. Uh, today, we are joined by a panel of experts from both the business and public safety sectors, including Freddie McBride. Uh, and I'll have, uh, maybe I'll just do quick introductions and then you guys can introduce yourselves if that's okay. Um, Grace Blake Turner, Duncan Swan, and I'm Wes Wright. So, uh, Freddie, would you like to introduce yourself and say a little bit more about your background? Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Wes. Uh, good day to everyone attending Ready23, and uh, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to join you today. Uh, my name is Freddie McBride. Uh, I'm Director of Policy and Regulation at the European Emergency Number Association. Um, I think most of you may have heard of us. I suppose we're the European equivalent of NINA. Um, and our mission is to promote public safety in Europe. So um, we we try to always answer that question about, you know, um, how can we get the best possible help to citizens um, who find themselves in an emergency situation? Um, and we, you know, we try and answer that question through our work on technology, our advocacy efforts, um, and in our collaboration with people and organizations like yourselves today. I'm a telecoms engineer by profession. Uh, I suppose a, a telecoms engineer turned regulator turned advocate, um, and I've been working in ICT and related activities for the last 25 years or so. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, Grace. Hi, good, uh, good afternoon from the UK, and thanks for having me. Grace Blake-Turner, I am the head of public safety in the UK at Amazon Web Services. So we work with partners such as Rapid SOS and the end customers in the national policing, regional policing, and also fire and rescue space. And one of our five key pillars is contact centers um, and the challenges around that and trying to do the best for our customers and ultimately their end customers, so the citizens that our customers serve. Before joining Amazon Web Services, I was a police officer myself uh, in the Metropolitan Police for 15 years, so acutely aware of some of the challenges that you all have out there. Thanks, Wes. Oh, sure. Thanks, Grace. Uh, Duncan. Thanks, Wes, uh, and good afternoon or good morning, wherever everybody is. Um, so I'm Duncan Swan, I'm the Chief Operating Officer at British APCO. Uh, it's a role I took on back in, in March 22. Uh, before that, I was a consultant providing advice and, and technical input on assignments, uh, delivering mobile comms, uh, critical control room solutions, and, and associated technologies for public safety organisations uh, here in the UK and as well as uh, much further afield. Probably just to add a few words uh, around British APCO then. We, we're a growing community. Uh, we, ally, we are allied to uh, APCO International in the States. Um, we've got extensive knowledge in public safety technology. Um, our knowledge base is certainly coming from our members' use and delivery of real-life public safety solutions. And British APCO is a registered charity. We're independent, uh, and we're here to work to improve emergency services and public safety communications and information technology for everybody's benefit. Great, thanks. Uh, and I'm Wes Wright. So in addition to kind of being an on-the-fly moderator, I'm the executive director of the NG911 Institute. And we're uh, we're based in Washington, D.C. What we do is we serve as an educational resource to members of Congress to talk about key issues um, of, of related to federal funding, reclassification. We'll get into some of this uh, as, we, as we talk through the panel. But we serve uh, the NG911 Caucus, which is bicameral and bipartisan. Uh, and, and again, um, Rapid SOS is one of our sponsors. We we host quarterly events where we either meet with Hill staff or we do lunch and learns to educate them on some of the, the benefits and the challenges associated with the 911 space. And then in February of each year, we do uh, an honor awards program and then the following day a technology showcase in DC. Again, inviting Hill staff to come and see kind of emerging technologies in the 911 space and, and some of the cool things that uh, Rapid SOS and others in this industry are doing. Uh, so that's a little bit about me, and I think you've met all the panelists. So let me, uh, I guess, dive right into some questions. Um, 
the, our discussion today will center around how public safety experts are collaborating on innovative technologies and policy frameworks to enable more seamless communication and rapid response during a crisis, with a special focus on building a safer global community through enhanced emergency communications networks. And I think, Duncan, uh, when we talked about this last week, the first question was for you, and it was, which European countries do you find uh, who have been notably forward thinking in their use of data to enhance their emergency response? And do you have you know, examples or anecdotes you'd like to share? Thanks, Wes. Yeah, I'll share a few, a few examples and a few anecdotes. I think what is notable is that currently, most European emergency services are only reached by voice telephone calls. We know that voice is an important part of any, any sort of emergency uh, communication, but the vast majority at the moment, voice is, is it. Um, but we, we also know that citizens, they expect to be able to contact emergency services with technologies they use to communicate every day. So including text and video calling, it, it's just second nature to, you know, to, to the majority of society. Um, I think it's a bit of context. When we look at next generation 112 or, or 999 or 911, then we're looking at integrating new technologies into emergency communications. So the emergency agencies can receive not just voice, but location information, real-time text, photos, video calls, and, and, and other data. So I think without doubt, location information has taken a huge step forward with, with advanced mobile locations and AML. In the UK, for instance, most mobile devices now share their location information with the emergency services when making a 999 emergency call. Uh, Finland's a great example, I believe, because they introduced the 112 Swarmy app. And, and if you haven't heard of the 112 Swarmy app, have a Google afterwards, have a look online and see what's on it. It's a whole rich sort of um, case, sets of case studies, but also what that particular app does. It was introduced primarily to share AML information with, the, with their emergency call centers. They have emergency call centers that please fire ambulance, uh, and other um, you know, various different agencies in there. But over time, that app has taken on several new dimensions in the way that you know, citizens have issued with traffic, with weather as an example. So it's not just there to, to call for emergency help, it's also there to provide information back that could help you in your day-to-day -day life, you know, knowing what's going on. I think what's also really, really important is the, the 112 Swami app will work in several other European countries, including Italy at the moment, and hopefully soon in Spain, Slovenia, and Romania. The reason that the other countries will be able to use that app is because they're all members of what's called the Pan-European Mobile Emergency Application. So there's a lot going on in Europe that's starting to push out, starting to allow you to use applications in more than just your, your, your home country, which I think is really, really important. So it's crossing the borders. I think in terms of other non-location related data usage, then that's nowhere near as widespread across Europe. And it still tends to be the more forward thinking emergency agencies in individual countries that pull data and in particular video from citizens. So this could be the likes of 999i, which in the UK has got a limited number of UK fire and rescue services who are using it. So one example is West Midlands Fire. Uh, it helps them visualize an incident being reported. They can actually get an idea of the scale of what they're seeing, be it scale of a road traffic collision or the scale of an actual fire. Um, for both police and ambulance, um, a good examples here, London Ambulance, West Yorkshire Police, they, they use the Good Sam application. And that works again in a very similar way with the call taker dispatcher requesting access to the device camera of the emergency call maker. So again, the process provides a live video feed. It's got accurate location information. It helps with dynamic decision making. I think that's one of the key things. Any information you've got that helps with dynamic decision making is really, really key. I think finally, I just want to touch on, on a recent 999 emergency communication system outage here in the UK. Um, some of you may have heard that back on the 25th of June, we lost our 999 system around five to six hours. The whole of the UK lost the 999 emergency communication system for five to six hours. So, not great. And yes, there was a tech issue. It hadn't been seen before. But what that actually drew out was a whole raft of underlying business continuity processes that were rubbish. That just didn't work and didn't sort of kick in in the right sort of way. Um, a key one was really telling um, citizens to use non-emergency numbers. We got one by one for police, one by one for, uh, for, for health, nothing for fire, nothing for coast guard. We do have a couple of numbers that can be used. But those numbers, whilst they actually direct a, a call to the right agency, they may to support any form of, of AML, any, any form of location information, which made the call taking and instant response significantly more difficult. Uh, our raises because a few of our emergency services here in the UK are now deploying solutions from the likes of Rapid SOS. And those that did do have the ability to pull information and use it when it's not the 999 emergency number. So when you've got a number of the numbers coming in, 
you can suddenly start to get rich information, rich data around uh, around what the pool is actually talking about. So it's really a little bit of a brief overview of some of the stuff that's going on, particularly in the UK, but also across Europe. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Duncan. So, Freddie, going over to you, uh, please tell us about any you know barriers to adoption of data that you've seen, and, and how more widespread adoption can kind of, can be promoted and generated, in your opinion. Sure. Um, so, you know, in, in Europe, uh, as in other parts of the world, actually, emergency communications, as Duncan said, remains voice centric. Um, and it's only really in the last few years with, you know, device location being available that we started to really see the benefits of having contextual data um, to supplement voice communications. Of course, that helped make PSAPs make decisions quicker um, and provided vital situational awareness for, for emergency responders. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much about the technology, but but those gaps do exist. And what you need to to move on is you need to have uh, something that catalyzes the adoption of this new technology. Um, and really, that's a number of things. But one of the, one of those things is to have a supportive policy framework. And we're seeing that in Europe right now. Um, so uh, just in 20, er, actually earlier this year, there was uh, a delegated regulation adopted. Um, and what it does is it requires EU member states um, to submit a roadmap for upgrading their PSAP systems to, to packet switched or IP based technologies. And they need to do that by the 5th of December this year. So, you know, there's there's a lot of urgency in this. Um, so, but the packet switch technology part is not mandatory requirement per se, but there are certain services and Duncan alluded to a few of them that have been mandated in legislation as well. So for example, eCall, over IMS, this is when your car calls emergency services. Um, so using IMS, that the PSAFs need to be able to support that in Europe by the 1st of January, 2026. Um, then other services, particularly for uh, persons with disabilities who need access, services like real-time text and total conversation, um, the PSAFs need to be ha able to handle those by June, 2027. So, you know, these mandatory services will therefore drive the adoption of the technology needed to have a seamless end-to-end -end environment for the transmission of data in Europe. Um, another important point in that, in that legislative framework is the definition of what we call the most appropriate PSAP. Um, it's been expanded to include, you know, so it's not just about where you deliver the emergency call, if we say, but that it, it's expanded to include that the PSAP, that it's the PSAP that can deliver the contextual data to the emergency responders. So that takes it beyond just, you know, dumping a call at one point. Um, there's still an obligation to get it to the emergency response. And that's what we want to see with data, a kind of an end-to-end -end environment where data can be shared with those who need it in the emergency supply chain. Um, the other I suppose point apart from the policy framework that's needed um, to you know to improve things is funding. Um, so you know in Europe um, we have the legislation now. the The roadmaps are going to be there, and the member states are going to have to come up with the money to 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 upgrade the PSAP systems. So some of those countries will be able to avail of European capital funding. It's unclear where others are going to get the. The, the capital um, at this stage, but we are keeping an eye on certainly develops in the US. Um, you know, we saw, you know, that it's been brought to Washington, the call for funding to accelerate NG911 adoption. And we certainly watch that with with interest. And I guess the other the other point um, in relation to improving the situation for, you know, end to end exchange of data is, you know, privacy. Um, and in Europe, we have had a data privacy regulation or a draft of it being discussed endlessly by the European Commission and the European Parliament representing the citizens and the European Council representing the member states. So certainly we at ENA would like to see a conclusion on this very quickly because it treats emergency contextual data differently to other data. Um, and this is something that would certainly improve the situation for, for, for getting you know, data services into PSAPs. Thanks, Freddie. Yeah, uh, I was going to talk a little bit about the transition to next gen 911 and how communication capabilities should be handled with respect primarily to public education, but we're going to touch on the funding thing too that you just mentioned. 
Um, but I think it's an important point not to just focus on the benefits of, of a next generation 911 system, but to communicate uh, with the public throughout that transition so that you can kind of manage expectations, explain what the system is capable of and what its current limitations are. Uh, former chairman of the FCC, Tom Wheeler, several years ago would say, you know, something along the lines of, the public does not always understand that Uber can find you based on your cell phone, but the 911 system can, can oftentimes not. Uh, and I think as people are more and more connected through cell phones, watches, smart appliances, we mentioned connected vehicles, uh, it becomes imperative to ensure that, that people understand the capabilities and limitations of the 911 system. But Freddie, like you were saying, you know, the biggest ob obstacle standing in the way of a transition here is funding. Uh, and we were very, very close at the end of last Congress to getting uh, federal funding passed that would have given up to $15 billion to build a next generation 911 network, you know, nationwide. It, it failed to pass the Senate at the last minute. And the money was going to be generated by the FCC auctioning a chunk of spectrum in the three gigahertz band. And a portion of the proceeds from that auction would then be used to fund the next generation 911 build out. And then it, the money could go to other, other causes too that were uh, you know, highlighted in the legislation. But the issue that prevented the legislation from passing uh, was a concern expressed by one senator that the spectrum that the FCC was going to auction is currently being used by the Department of Defense. So that was a concern. It, it caused the legislation not to pass. The Defense Department was ordered to study uh, its current use of the spectrum and determine you know, whether it could migrate out of that band about how long it would take, whether it was possible to coexist. Um, and the DOD's report was due at the end of the government's fiscal year, which was the end of September. So the, the report uh, is done, but it has not been widely shared. Through the Institute, we met with several Senate offices a couple of weeks ago, just to, to check in with staff and talk about funding and, and reclassification. At the time we spoke with staff, they had been able to review a heavily redacted version of the report, or they had gotten summaries from people but had not you know, reviewed the whole report. And it was not clear when that unredacted version would even be available so that then that hopefully could make the Senate comfortable in moving forward with reinstituting uh, the FCC's auction authority and then allowing uh, the, the government to use a portion of those funds from the auction to fund a next generation 911 system. So stay tuned on that front. We were very, very close about 10 or 11 months ago and we seem to be a little bit further uh, from the finish line now, but you know, hope springs eternal. Um, and I wanted to close by saying federal funding is critical, but it should be done in a way that also preserves autonomy for state and local governments to spend that money as they deem appropriate. You know, each state has different challenges with respect to their 911 systems, whether that's geographic, uh, you know, topographical problems. You know, some have more uh, constituent needs on, on certain parts of the system than others. So federal funding is critical uh, because of the steep price tag to build this network and to make it fully interoperable. But state and local control of the money is equally as important to make sure that the system delivers what the public deserves and what they expect. And I imagine the issues around funding and autonomy are, are similar in Europe, Grace. And if you'd like to you know, pick up the baton and, and discuss that a bit, we'd be, uh, we'd be grateful. Yeah, thanks, Wes. And um, also, thanks for stepping in as our moderator at such short notice we do appreciate it um so i was going to talk a little bit about how you innovate together and through that is around collaboration with understanding and to go down to your point Wes, and also what freddie was saying one of the things i really encourage the private industry to do when speaking to public sector customers is really understand their funding models where is the money coming from how do they procure how do they go to market because at the end of the day we really need to lean into the public safety space especially in emergency and non-emergency communication with absolute empathy the public's uh, safety customers right now, that they're, they're really going through it. Like they literally cannot see the wood for the trees. They are fighting some of them figuratively fires in front of them, which makes it really difficult to take that step back and innovate. And for the public safety customers, I would encourage you to reach into your private sector partners, not just for, hey, what's the end technology? What can help me get there where I need? But some of the bigger topics too, because some of the bigger topics such as innovation, sustainability, well-being of staff, you know, some of our customers have 18-year-olds who are listening to the worst that people can do to each other on a daily basis. And that really takes its toll. So it's really difficult for those senior leaders when they're dealing with that day-to-day -day and then and they get the news that they haven't got the funding through or there's legislative changes coming as freddie was saying or as duncan was saying
saying they've only got one form of way to answer the calls at the moment, how they take that step back is, is a struggle. So I would really encourage you to lean into your private sector partners and see what else is on offer because most of, most of us can give office space, workshops. You know, we've been grappling with these huge topics, strategy, thought leadership for such a long time, and that can make the real difference in the pace of innovation and how we innovate to tackle these challenges together. But if we don't do it with collaboration and we don't do it with an understanding of where our customers are at and where the public safety space really is, it can become a real challenge for us. Thanks, Grace. No, that, I think that's a really good point. Um, I, we have about 10 minutes left, maybe a little bit less. So we'll, we'll go with one more question and we can go around the horn again. Um, but what do you see going on in the intelligent safety space that gives you hope? And what might it mean for the communities and nations that you serve? Um, and I don't know if, if someone would like to take it first or I can call randomly. Yeah, I'm happy to to jump in from the off. So I think um, despite all those challenges I've just mentioned, there is a lot of hope out there. And something we see in the UK market is that appetite for change and to explore and to innovate. To go back to something Duncan mentioned at the start, we've seen our regional policing customers um, look at different ways that the communities and the public want to actually make contact. So Bedfordshire Police are using a chatbot based on Amazon Connect, which has actually reduced demand in their non-emergency space by 20% at the moment. So that's huge for senior leaders because they can put that resource elsewhere and it's helping cut, you know, the end citizen as well. We've also seen Kent Police. Um, they had they won the Society of Evidence-Based Policing uh, Innovation Award last year for something called the RVR trial, which is where um, they had uh, victims of domestic abuse at the lowest level. And instead of having an officer go to their house, which can take a very long time if demand is high let's face it they would have a video phone call with that officer if the risk was deemed low enough and the results of that trial led to 100 percent victim satisfaction so when you speak to these end customers who are willing to take chances willing to innovate willing to use technologies there's real appetite out there which gives me real hope and makes me really excited for the future thanks grace um duncan i don't know if you have any thoughts I think a little bit away from, from what Grace was just talking about, that actually picks up on the theme of the very open, very open of Radio 23, um, which we really to Mike and Karen when we were talking. Um, one of the things we're starting to see in the UK are agencies wanting to share information. So we've got something called the Multi Agency Incident Transfer Mate. Um, it's been around since 2017, it's been used in Wales quite a lot. It's now being picked up and adopted by the English Fire and Rescue Service, something which came out of the Grenfell Tower fire back in 2017. Uh, which was horrendous. There were, were seventy odd people who were killed in, in the tower block. Um, Two hundred and thirty people actually got out, got out alive, thankfully. There were some real recommendations that came out of that report um, to be able to share information between uh, control rooms because one control room, London Fire, could not handle all of the nine 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 calls in a particular night. They they enlisted the six or seven control rooms. So fire rescue services have now recognised they need to put in place um, a schema which allows sharing of, of information between agencies, be it fire and rescue services, police, ambulance, national highways, local authorities, to, to make sure that when you've got an incident, you're sharing the right information the right sort of way. Um, we're actually seeing that being more widely adopted. And the key thing there is the, 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 the evidence we've got from, from, from the Wales is that a transfer on a telephone, which on average would take four to five minutes, takes 16 seconds. And it's accurate. And you don't have to look at the spell of how you're doing it. So little things can actually make a really, really big difference. You could say the same about real-time text, speech to text, the translation services, which, which can come in on tonight. There's a whole raft of little things that make a really big difference. And, and that's really what I see as being some of the areas that are really giving us hope and taking some of the burden off our frontline critical comm staff because they're, they're allowing them to buy a little bit more time to have things a lot more accurate and to do the jobs you know, a lot better. Thanks, Duncan. Uh, Freddie. Yeah, well, actually, um, what, what I was, was going to say was, you know, I, I, I see huge opportunities maybe to to pick up on what both Grace and Duncan are talking about. I see huge opportunities for AI and machine learning in the PSAP environment. Uh, and really, you know, when we look at the, the constraints that PSAPs have, financial and more recently, you know, the human resource constraints where recruitment and retention of good people has never been more challenging. Um, and certainly there's there's scope for AI and machine learning applications to play a role in ensuring that, you know, the PSAP employee's time is used effectively. So I, non-filtering of emergency uh, communications, I think Duncan mentioned that. There's a there, That's an area where there's a lot of potential um, on 
uh, caller or sorry, on call taker, you know, uh, emotional and psychological well-being. I think Grace alluded to that too. Um, you know, the AI can be used to kind of monitor with a small M, you know, the how things are going over the course of the day for the call takers and ensure that where there's a need for an intervention, that it can be done in a proactive way rather than waiting until, you know, a call taker has gone through a very traumatic experience. So there's certainly, you know, scope there. Um, just on it as well, and, you know, we'll be talking about policy frameworks, but in Europe, we, we have the AI Act now, which is, if you like, it's it creates a, a if you like a, a a proactive ex ante framework for the introduction of AI in your not just in emergency services but in other areas as well. But it what it does say is that certain applications, such as some of those used in in, in our sphere, like biometric profiling and law enforcement, for example, would be considered high risk, and all high risk AI systems will be assessed before being put on the market and also throughout their life cycle. So the you know that's it in a nutshell. The higher the risk, the more regulatory intervention. Um, but it, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider that as as something to be negative about. I think it's important to have it there. Um, and uh, you know, certainly, um, I'd be, you know, on the one hand, optimistic, and and on the other hand, always a little bit concerned and cautious when we talk about these technologies. Um, and more discussion needs to be had. But I think as long as they're used in an assistive way. Um, and decisions are taken by humans ultimately, then I think we'll be okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the the emotional well-being too of the call takers because that's a that's an important piece. And I do see where you know the AI component can help with with some of that. Um, the other thing that that we always think about here, I'm sure, is, is the same is true there. But as additional information becomes available to these call takers and things like video, the the toll that that would take is is definitely exponentially greater than what they're seeing now. And there's one little plug we have through the Institute that uh, the 911 Saves Act is a piece of legislation that uh, has been introduced. If it's enacted, it would essentially update the national classification of the 911 telecommunicator from what is today an office or administrative support role to a protective service occupation. And I think it recognizes the, the abilities that these people have and, and, the, and the key that they in saving the lives of the public and first responders. And, and really it is. Uh, becoming much more of a of a stressful job, and there are there are technologies that can increase, um, you know, improve outcomes and make the the response more efficient. But also, we need to be mindful of of the call takers and do what we can to support them too. And I, Grace, you touched on it with, you know, the whole community coming together and and things like that. So that's um, that's the only thing I wanted to add. I don't know if people uh, anybody has a, a parting thought or, or words you want to leave with. We have about a minute left. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, hopefully this was a helpful thing and, and um, you enjoyed the session. I know that we've got a lot of other great stuff on tap for later today. So, uh, yes, yeah, stay tuned. Thanks, Wes, for stepping in and uh, yeah, sure. enjoy the rest Be of nice the conference. nice to your everyone. moderator when you guys uh, evaluate <laughs> the session. Thanks. Thank you. thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.